Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. If the reports are true, we may be about to see some big news on the filibuster and voting rights, and it's about time. According to Rolling Stone, President Biden has told top Democrats that after all this time, after all the pressure applied, including here on this show, he may finally be ready to step off the sidelines and lobby for filibuster reform in order to get a voting rights bill passed. Anonymous sources have told Rolling Stone that Biden promised Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Speaker Nancy Pelosi that he's ready to apply the pressure needed on moderate Democrats who are still opposed to ending the filibuster. Biden has reportedly told Schumer, Chuck, you tell me when you need me to start making phone calls. All that as the Senate returns to work this week and Senate Democrats are reportedly very near an agreement on a new voting rights bill. Joining me now to discuss is president of Repairers of the Breach, Bishop William Barber and co-founder of Indivisible, Ezra Levine. Bishop Barber, what do you make of this new report from Rolling Stone? Well, it's an interesting uh, piece. You know, we've been keeping the pressure on. People have gone to jail. We've been marching. We've been pushing. We've been putting in thousands of calls. We know with the filibuster, Charles, that not one piece of progressive justice-making legislation in the history of this country ever since they came up with the filibuster has never not been filibustered. It's a bad piece of non-constitutional uh, uh, um, uh, work. It should never have been a part of the system. We know that it should be ended. And we've got two questions, though. S this past Saturday represented 3,000 days, 3,000 days since the uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was gutted. So it's been 3,000 days that Congress has had a chance to work. They haven't. Now we hear there's possibly a new bill. But we got to be careful to make sure that we know what's in that bill, because the filibuster is always used to either kill it or weaken it so bad. So we can't just jump up and say we're on the bandwagon. First of all, we got to examine this new bill, know it clearly what's in it, make sure that it lives up to what's needed and what John Lewis really wanted in it since he wrote the For the People's Act. And then we must not only say just for voting rights, because people need living wages, we need a real infrastructure spending bill that's not just $3 trillion. The Economic Policy Institute says we need $10 trillion. We need police reform. And, and so we, we got to be careful here that we don't get played. And that is you get offered up a mansion voting bill that's so weakened that it's not what's really needed. Now, I don't know. We haven't seen the language, but we've got to look at the language. And if that's the case, it's past time to end the, the filibuster, because what they're using now is a coward filibuster. Doesn't even require you to debate. And that should have never been the case in the first place. So, Ezra, you know, last July, Biden vowed that, you know, getting a voting rights bill passed will be, quote, one of the first thing that he would do as president. That has not been one of the first things he's done. It's not even been one of the first things he's been focused on doing. So why now? What, what is, what is this, if this story is true, what is the spur in the saddle that is making him move now? You know, honestly, Charles, I think it's that we're getting close to the end of the reconciliation fight, the, the fight for infrastructure. And he has, up until now, as long as that has been a live fight, been unwilling to take up the fight for democracy. Now, that is a strategic choice that I disagreed with, I think Bishop Barber disagreed with, that many people disagreed with. We thought democracy needed to come first, but that's not what he chose. He chose to work on roads and bridges first. But we are coming to the end of that fight. There is going to be a reconciliation bill that passes the House. We're gonna get that through the Senate. And then the legislative calendar is clear. Now, you said that it might look like he's joining the game, that he's getting into the field. Now, I hope so, I hope so. We had a a fear that he wasn't just on the sidelines, but he's at home on the couch, not even watching the game. And it turns out, based on this report, that he is indeed watching the game. Maybe he's on the sidelines, but he's not in the game yet. What we have heard is somebody told somebody who told somebody that he would actually get in this fight. Now, do you remember reading a report in the Rolling Stones, or the New York Times, or anywhere else where Joe Biden told somebody who told somebody that he was willing to fight for infrastructure? No, he's been out there fighting for infrastructure. So this is a good this is a good step. Look, I like reading this, but I will believe it when I see it. 
I want to see action on this bill. I want to see the bill passed, and I want to see our elections protected in 2022. And I didn't want to see reports quoting somebody who's quoting somebody. I want to see President Biden out there fighting for our democracy. Uh, Mr. Barber, you have been putting pressure on Joe Manchin like probably no one else uh, in America. What do you think the difference would be that for to have President Biden also join your fight of putting pressure on Joe Manchin? Well, it, as you said, it should have been engaged from the beginning. We said from the beginning you needed to protect three infrastructures, the infrastructure of our democracy first, voting rights, and, and then the infrastructure of our daily lives, living wages and health care, and then the infrastructure of our roads and bridges and technology. The presidency is the greatest bully pulpit in the world. And the president can say, along with the Senate leader to somebody like Manchin, you don't do this, you don't get your infrastructure, you don't get the things you want in your state. It is an atrocity, Charles, that there are 168 members of the Congressional Black Caucus and the Progressive Caucus and two black senators and one senator from West Virginia gets to act like he's in control. You know, basically, it's high time for the Congress and for the president to say, wait a minute, you're not Joe um, Biden, you weren't elected president, and you're not going to run this democracy in the hole. You're not going to be a part of the demolition crew of this democracy. And what needs to happen is Manchin needs to be faced. If I also say the president, if he's going to do this, he needs to go to Texas, talk to people, go to West Virginia. He needs to go to Arizona. Then he needs to go to the well of the Congress and say why he's going to do this. But I also want to say, Charles, we got to make sure now that if there is this move to end the filibuster or change it, what is it? I don't necessarily like the carve out if it's only going to be for voting rights, but you're not going to do living wages. You're not going to do a real infrastructure and an economic spending plan that's going to lift the poor and low wealth, and you're not going to do police reform. And then if what we're carving it out for is a mansion concoction of a voting rights of the For the People's Act, what about the Voting Rights Act uh, 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 restoration and, and that part? What's in the bill? What's in the bill? What is it really going to do? Is it going to stop what's happening at the state, at the state level? I believe that part of what's happening here is the president and others see that the, 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 the Republicans are playing for the long game. McCarthy said they want to rule for 100 years. That's what they said. That's why they're doing these things in the state. And so maybe somebody's seeing that. I hope we haven't waited too late. But the bottom line is we've got to end this non-constitutional filibuster that's being used to block constitutional rights. And I don't think they're as close to getting that infrastructure as they want to. You know, Manchin's already talking about he wants to roll back the economic piece. He wants to cut it. And, you know, the other day I said, who is he? Who is he? to say that he can compromise on the needs of the people and say poor people have and low wealth people have had enough. So we've got work to do in this democracy. If the president's going to get in, I would say this, get in with mm -hmm. both feet all the way up to your nose and let's save this democracy. Ezra, uh, you know, Mr. Barber make, brings up an interesting point, which is, you know, Biden is not saying that he's going to go to the well of Congress. He's not saying he's going to take that, take the, take this on the road, as he said, you know, uh, a couple of months ago. He's not saying he's going to make a public appeal. If the Rolling Stone story is right, he's saying, "When do you want me to pick up the phone and make co phone calls behind the scenes?" Why do you think that is? Why, why, why not make a public pressure campaign on these senators rather than a private pressure campaign? Well, look, I think it ought to be public and not just on these two senators. Look, I know Manchin and Cinema get a lot of the press. They get a lot of the coverage. It is not just Manchin and Cinema who are out there preventing this from getting done. We're looking at Dianne Feinstein in California, John Hickenlooper in Colorado. We have to worry about Coons and Carper in Delaware. There's Mark Warner in Virginia. We're worried about a lot of senators who aren't getting a lot of press for being against actually getting this democracy bill done. But behind closed doors, are they out there pushing? Are they pushing the president? Are they actually pushing their leadership to get this done? We don't think so. So I think the president ought to be traveling all over the country, making the argument for this. And I think it'll work. And here's why I think it'll work. He's doing the exact thing for infrastructure right now. 
So why would you engage in this fight for infrastructure where you got to get the exact same votes? And the way you do that is by you go to Texas, you go to Georgia, you go to Illinois, you go to California, you go all over, you send your secretaries all over to make the case. That's what it looks like to fight for historic legislation. It's what the president is doing now. We would like to see him do that for our democracy. And so, uh, and Mr. So, Barber, I just want to ask, ask you know, yes, you want to you chime in on that, Bishop Barber? Go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead and ask the question. No, see, I, you know, I, I, I just wanted to bring it back around to the idea if they come in with a mansion light, you know, some sort of voting rights bill that is not a restoration of, of, of what was struck down by the Supreme Court, that does not give full protection and reverse what has been that happened in places like Texas and Georgia. Would you encourage senators and members of the House to vote against whatever it is, even if they can get something but not what all that you wanted them to get? Well, I'm, I'm not one of these that say you ought to want some of your constitutional rights. Uh, I don't know anybody that swore to just get some of the constitutional rights. And it says that no state has the right to deny or abridge the right to vote. So whatever's passed has to ensure that that's not happening. And you can't then use this bill to slip things into a law that Republicans have wanted that we've been fighting in court. For instance, I hear that in this particular piece of legislation, he's trying to slip voter ID in, a uh, uh, former photo ID or, or, or voter ID, which we're in court right now fighting. Uh, is he going to weaken the piece around dark money? Uh, is, it, is this bill going to protect all of the access that 56 million Americans used in the last election? So we have to read the fine print. You know, somebody said today, just, just finish the job. But you got to do more than finish the job. You have to finish it right. It has to be finished just. It has to meet the moment of the day. And the president said that this is the greatest attack on voting rights since just after the Civil War. If that's true, and it is, then you cannot have, get, you cannot give someone aspirin for pneumonia. You cannot have the antidote be less than the sickness. And so I'm very concerned. I, I th I'm very concerned that Manchin was put in charge of writing the bill and not, say, Senator Warnock, who gave them the powers. It was his, his election, Senator Warnock and, and, the, and the other uh, senator in Georgia. Why weren't they given the chair of this committee and then Manchin be on the committee? We are leaning too much into this man that we know is following the guidelines of the Chamber of Commerce and the, uh, and the Koch brothers, that we know is willing to hurt people in his own state. So this is a real battle. And it's not, not just as simple as where we get something, it's what do we get? And I don't believe if we can't get the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, a full for the People's Act, living wages and real infrastructure that we will have done what this moment requires. And for God's sake, we can't end the filibuster for something that's actually after it's passed is going to take us backwards rather than forward. So we've got to look at the fine print. You know, we put the fox watching the hen house. Manchin is the fox. Well, if he's a reformed fox and he's going to do right, then I'm all with that. But if he's still trying to be slick and sly, we have to be careful. Bishop Barber and Ezra Levine, thank you, gentlemen, both tonight for joining me. Nice, fascinating story. We're going to stay on top of it. Hopefully, to have you back if there are more developments. Thank you for being here tonight.